Okay, so good evening everyone. Uh, welcome to the sixth lecture or week 05. Uh, how was is, how is the assignment? Were everybody able to submit on time? Submit? Yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's okay. I mean, uh, it's not like it's a binary you know, attempt, right? We'll, we'll see. I mean, based on the, uh, we'll go through the uh, effort that you've, you know, we need to put an equal effort to go through the uh, assignments, right? So, okay. Uh, so, couple of uh, announcement points. I mean, I think uh, some of you have used the assignment, uh, the discussion board, uh, to ask some queries. Some of you have actually also sent me queries, but I think it's more efficient if you send a query uh, to the discussion board because other people could be watching it. And you can actually uh, subscribe to the discussion board so you, ac you actually know when there is activity. So you don't miss out on if there is some interesting piece of information on any of the assignment questions and stuff. Uh, there's also a feedback link uh, on the on every lecture actually, uh, which you could uh, give. Uh, there's also there's actually a feedback link for even the assignment on the assignment uh, page, so you could potentially give your response on how, you know uh, on the different questions. Uh, so project report uh, first report is due on March first, which is only two weeks. Uh, so for this for this week. Uh, I think it's important to, uh, since you are already had the momentum and have actually gone through at least the classification pipeline, so hopefully you can, uh, you know, uh, use that prior information to uh, uh, get started on the projects. Uh, so the second assignment, uh, uh, it will be out on February 22nd, and uh, it will also have three weeks duration, and it will probably be easier. So. There's that. So today, uh, actually, I was initially planning to cover something called unsupervised learning, but we'll get to unsupervised learning maybe in graphical models. And today, we'll continue uh, text analysis uh, and uh, recurrent neural networks. <coughs> so uh, before I jump into the uh, content of today's lecture. Uh, I came across a couple of uh, announcements. I guess I'm on some mailing list, so it may be of interest to some of you who are still thinking about which projects to choose. Uh, so you don't have to participate in these challenges, but there is some ready data set that you can see if you want to use them. So one is a, one is a uh, medical image, uh, I think classification of, of some anomalies from medical images, and the second one is uh, from speech, you can try to figure out, uh, you know, do some classification there, uh, like identify a child versus an adult, or if the speaker has a cold or not, and so on. Anyway, so let's get to, uh, um, let's review what we uh, looked at last week. Uh, I don't know how many of you could uh, absorb the material from last week, so we are going to again look at word embeddings and uh, recurrent neural networks, but a little bit more depth and uh, a little bit no, bit narrow focus than what we saw last time. So last time we spent trying to understand the idea of embeddings and try to understand the idea of uh, recurrent neural networks. So today we're going to try to go into a little bit more depth on these two topics. So for the deep learning part of this course, the two or three major building blocks that you need to take away are uh, convolutional neural networks, word embeddings, and recurrent neural networks. So those are the three uh, main uh, tools or layers or uh, techniques that on which you're going to build your uh, uh, analytics uh, pipelines, right? Okay, so let's start with uh, RNNs. So, so what's the need for an RNN? RNN is trying to capture the idea of persistence as in, let's say you're classifying 10 things. Maybe those 10 things came in an order. Right. Uh, so, if there is some order relationship uh, that you observe ten different images, but they were in an order, then the classification that you're going to perform on the tenth image should probably take into account of what all <coughs> did you classify or what all did you see in the previous nine images. Right. 
so that is the notion of uh, persistence and uh, diagrammatically they kind of show it as a, a, a transformation from input to output with a self loop in the uh, transformation block. But uh, as we saw last time, it is actually equivalent to uh, a <coughs> diagram like this, where the previous inputs, they get transformed and there could be intermediate outputs, but uh, there is some uh, transfer of information from the previous decision stage to the next decision stage. So these could be vectors, right? So if you remember from last time, uh, this square block could be a neural network block. Uh, this could be the output of a neural network. <coughs> and uh, this uh, output could be, for example, the hidden activation. So if there is only single uh, neural network layer. Um, yeah. So for in vanilla uh, recurrent neur neural networks, uh, uh, as I said, this is the input, uh, this is the output, and uh, this is the input for at, at stage at, at the stage second stage. So, for example, in this case, I have t input in a sequence. For example, it could be a time series, it could be a time series of images, it could be a sequence of words in a sentence, and uh, the output could be <coughs> some uh, some trigger that you want to trigger uh, once you see that sequence of images or uh, once you see the sequence of words. Right. It could even be, for example, the translation of uh, the sequence of words from English to uh, some other language. Okay, so actually, I wanted to motivate uh, last time what the vanilla RNN would look like on the inside of this block, and it was quite simple. It was just one layer of the neural network that you've seen uh, in the first uh, two three lectures. It was uh, so at any at, at stage t, you have the input x t, you have the previous uh, RNN blocks uh, output, which uh, is, I've just represented it as h t minus one. So those two are concatenated. So just uh, if it's a 10-dimensional vector and uh, another 20-dimensional vector, you get a 30-dimensional vector. <coughs> That's the vector which is input to a uh, nonlinear transformation. So this Spanish uh, layer is just a W times uh, let's say h e minus one x t plus b. So this is what it is, and then you'll get a HD. So that's what it's doing. So this is the simplest uh, RNN, uh, and you can. Uh, so the key thing is that this this weight and this uh, bias is going to be common across all these uh, uh, blocks. So it's as if there is some imaginary uh, weight matrix which is being uh, referenced to from this block, from this block, from this block. Okay, and. Uh, as we were motivating RNN, we wanted to place it in the context of uh, classification, right? So in classification, we had a fixed input and a fixed output. Uh, for example, in your assignments, you've seen uh, images of fixed sizes and then uh, fixed classes, cats versus dogs, or 10 uh, labels for uh, the CIFAR data set. Uh, RNNs can uh, do uh, these other blocks, other diagrams that I'm showing you. And the key thing is this: these green arrows. So there's some transfer of information from one uh, stage to the next. So in this case, it's a uh, uh, image caption. So image could be the input and uh, a sequence of words which describe the image can be the output. And uh, right now, it may be unbelievable that you can actually create a, uh, an, a system which takes images as an input and can output a string of words. But if you had a lot of label data of images and uh, uh, text which describe those images individually, then you can actually uh, build this. And it's not based on memorization. Right. A very trivial thing you can do is just memorize every image and hopefully uh, uh, the test image is the same as uh, uh, your training image. So it's not happening. Uh, so it actually has to generalize. So it, it, if it hasn't seen a new uh, image before, it still has to describe that image. Right. Uh, a different variation of that is when you have more inputs but a single output. For example, uh, it could be a sentiment analysis where you have a string like a Twitter, a tweet or a short movie review or even um, you know, a long uh, review and then you want to map it to uh, the sentiment of that or sentiment or some single characteristic of that uh, blurb of text, right? 
So, and the next version is uh, when there's a sequence of input and a sequence of output, and the common example is machine translation, uh, where which is just a name for uh, non-human translation. So, basically, going from uh, English to let's say French or Chinese. And the last version is uh, uh, it's just a special case of this, and it's aligned. And here we are just waiting till the last uh, last input uh, of the first uh, last input, and then only we're starting the output. So. That's the only slight change there. Okay, so the vanilla RNN that I showed earlier, uh, it actually has something called the uh, uh, vanishing gradient, the explo exploding gradient problem, and, uh, and we are just not going to go into the detail of how the gradient explodes or vanishes. But you can imagine in your assignments, uh, since you did not work on more than one hidden layer, I think, so you did not see the product of uh, weight matrices, so what happens is if you have more than uh, one layer, uh, you have to take the, when you take the gradients, uh, W1 can get multiplied with W2 when you look at the gradient uh, with respect to let's say uh, W3, I mean, okay, W3 times W2 could be a part of uh, the gradient computation for W1. Let's say W1 is at the, almost at the beginning of the, beginning of your neural network and W2 and W3 are sub subsequent, uh, then the matrices multiply and then when matrices multiply, they the effect of a matrix on a vector is essentially this, right? It's kind of uh, scales. You know, one of the one of the effects is going to be scale effect. So it can amplify the in, uh, input vector. It can uh, kind of shrink uh, the energy in the input vector. That's captured by something called uh, uh, like if you have the uh, 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 eigenvalue or the singular val singular ve singular value, then you can see uh, if the value is greater than one, then it's kind of kind of uh, scale the input vector. Okay. So Anyway, the vanilla RNN have issues and that's why people have come up with some special structures uh, and one of the structures is called uh, an LSTM, uh, stands for long short term memory. And, uh, and it has a very similar uh, block diagram to uh, an RNN. Uh, the repeating model module is slightly different and uh, it has a bit of interpretation that we went through last time. And so if you can see instead of a single tanish that was there before, like xt was going to tanish, uh, and it was just coming out as ht somehow, right? Here there's three other uh, neural network layers, uh, neural network blocks put in, and uh, you can see that they are being used uh, with a sigma nonlinearity or, or a sigmoid nonlinearity. So these are actually, uh, uh, yeah, these are actually called gates. Okay, so let's uh, just recap what we saw. So each block, uh, we can think of a vector when it when it is passing through that block, it it has it, it's called that cells uh, that block state. Okay, so we're calling it uh, cell state. So so see, there is there is no storing operation. So there is actually no memory here, right? But uh, when x t uh, when x t plus one, uh, sorry, when x t minus one. Uh, went into this block uh, and some operations happen, the intermediate vector value is ct minus 1 and that's what we are calling as a cell state. That just that vector is just passed to the next uh, uh, next block and uh, this, this block will also have its own cell state. So that's, so the memory part of LSTM is essentially the cell state, okay. Uh, and it's called memory because it's, although this, all these computations happen you know, there is no blockage, so there is, uh, uh, you know, it's like a flow of uh, vectors from here to here. Uh, but since you can imagine it happening per time step, so there's notion of memory. Um, okay, so let's focus on cell state. Um, uh, okay, the cell state is uh, something which captures some long-term in, uh, information, the persistence information that we were talking about. And uh, that long range, uh, long term inf information, which is captured in a vector, so just a bunch of numbers, can be uh, can be reset or can be added to. So you want to remove information, you want to add information. So uh, that's being captured by a couple of operations, and we can uh, look into those operations first. And I said uh, last time we had this notion of gate, right? So a gate is. Uh, so uh, there are three gates in the LSTM. So a gate is made of a sigmoid a neural network layer and the point-wise multiplication operation. Uh, so the gate operation is like this. So there's an input u. Uh, 
to a sigmoid layer. The output is going to be a vector, uh, which is going to have outputs between 0 to 1. So it's like a soft gate. It's like a switch. It should act like a switch. Right. So the output is going to be between 0 to zero to 1. And it's going to do an element-wise multiplication with v to give me an output vector. So the output vector is going to be the same dimension as v. It's just that every every coordinate of it is is getting amplified. Let's say if, it, if, if, if this gate output is all 1s, then v is just f of u comma v is just v. Uh, if the gate is uh, if the gate's output is all zeros, then output is zero. Okay. Yeah. So the first step, uh, first component of the LSTM is to uh, throw away some cell state. So cell state is being passed. If you remember the horizontal line, C T minus one is uh, coming into this current state, current uh, cell block as well, right? C T minus one was being passed into this block. So we want to forget some part of ct-1 and uh, to forget uh, we need to uh, operate this gate right. So gate output we know it is going to be uh, uh, a vector which is going to have the same dimension as a CT's, uh, ct vectors dimension but how do we control its input? We only have two inputs right the hidden state uh, ht-1 and xt. So those two are the only inputs with which we control the gates. So uh, these two inputs uh, are passed through the sigmoid nonlinearity and uh, output a vector and that vector is multiplied with ct-1 point wise uh, element wise okay so so here was an example that we were discussing last time so the cell state may include the gender of the current subject i mean some number which potentially corresponds to the gender of the uh, uh, current subject in one of the coordinates let's say then when a new subject is observed uh, let's say in xt then you need to forget the gender of that uh, old subject. So, uh, so ht minus one and xt uh, pass through, and uh, a particular coordinate, for example, of, of this gate, this forget gate, uh, may be may become zero, and then the corresponding coordinate in the cell state may become zero. Okay, that's the interpretation. And uh, you see, this formula is the same as uh, this, but there's a <coughs> sigmoid uh, nonlinearity. That's all. Next, uh, we have removed information. Now we need to add information. Again, our two inputs gonna, are going to be ht minus one and uh, xt. Okay. Uh, so how do we add information? Uh, so uh, first, first of all, a gate decides whether we want to add information, and if it decides to add information, then what information we need to add? That's computed by uh, the regular Tanish layer that we saw in the vanilla RNN, right? In the vanilla RNN, there was one only one neural network layer. Uh, that was the uh, uh, tanish layer right so diagrammatically it, it looks like look like looks like this and so this is the uh, vanilla rnn's uh, nonlinear uh, sorry the nonlinearity and the hidden layer right so this is the computation which is happening here ht minus 1 and xt are going are going through the tanish nonlinearity before going through they have their own weight matrices and biases which get added and the c tilde t is computed but with the same two inputs after this concatenation, the sigmoid uh, nonlinearity or the sigmoid no neural network layer uh, 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 computes what is called uh, the input gate, okay, and it's going to modulate uh, whether I should add this information or not. So in the last step, basically we modify the cell state. Uh, we modify the cell state by first forgetting, so element-wise multiplication with the previous cell state. And uh, once we decide which information we need, we want to uh, add to the cell state, uh, which is com controlled by the input gate, we add it back to, we add it element wise to the uh, cell state vector. Okay. So that's the interpretation of uh, this architecture. And uh, why, why all these uh, gates are present is because uh, we want to control the vanishing gradient uh, or the exploding gradient problem and uh, capture the notion of persistence in a better way. So people have figured out different different architectures of how uh, uh, such a recurrent uh, network block can be designed and they have, they have kind of zeroed in on one of the uh, variants which is this LSTM, right. Um, finally there is a small, uh, 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 there is also a final uh, uh, change of the, so from the cell state I also want to output the current uh, HT, right. So that is just going to be a simple transformation. Uh, uh, so we uh, just scale the output of cell state. Uh, so there is no neural network layer here. It's just a uh, rescaling of the input element-wise to between zero to one. Uh, sorry, zero minus one to one. And uh, 
the output gate just decides what what is presented uh, to the to the uh, uh, what is what is output to the what what is output as ht okay so for example ht itself could be the output could be the word vector of a um, could be the, could be the word vector or could be the uh, scores of a, of a classifier right so uh, so there is additional regulation happening here okay um, so any questions of these three components in, in an LSTM? Okay, so as uh, so we were focusing uh, on elements inside a block. So, but uh, as you saw in in Keras API as well, you can have uh, you can add layers. Right. So similarly for RNNs, you can you can also add uh, you can stack layers on top of each other. So there's a lot of transformations happening from let's say you already set the weights, so the, the Ws and Bs of all the gates and all the the tarnished layer. Uh, uh, then what's happening is all all these inputs, the sequence of inputs, these uh, let's say vector representations of uh, whatever inputs these are, are getting passed uh, passed into uh, the blocks. And for example, this input has an effect on many blocks and has effect all the way to uh, for example the teeth uh, output okay and uh, it's just that because we chose tanh sigmoid uh, uh, sigmoid uh, nonlinearities and uh, hopefully we choose a suitable uh, loss for example even a cross entropy loss that you've seen already uh, it turns out that the whole block diagram uh, uh, has all differentiable parts so you can actually uh, now locally kind of focus on uh, back propagation and actually derive the backdrop uh, e uh, equations and you can find the best parameters for uh, the task that you are looking at and the task uh, we are looking at is uh, what I uh, kind of categorized a uh, few slides ago the fixed input fixed output versus sequence of input versus sequence of outputs okay uh, any questions on this part yeah yeah. No, so because they are differentiable, it's not zero comma one, right? It's between zero to one. Yeah, yeah. So the whole point of choosing that uh, nonlinearity sigmoid is because uh, then it's a smooth function. Uh, in the sense it's differentiable. If it was a 0, 1 function, then it would have been a problem uh, learning the weights. Yeah. Mm. Okay, so word embeddings. So, what did we see la last time? Um, so, words or characters or even sentences are merely symbols, right? I mean, there is a, there's a meaning attached to, that, attached to these uh, symbols. Uh, we want actually semantically similar words to be represented similarly. Okay, so we want a representation which uh, captures semantically similar words to be close together, and this is the idea behind what is called the vector space models in natural language processing. Okay, and it comes from, uh, as I said, uh, it comes from something called the distribution hypothesis, where uh, words that appear in the same context share semantic meaning. So, cats, dogs may may, may appear in the context of when you when you're talking about animals. Uh, you know, options, futures, and stocks can come in the context of uh, finance. Uh, 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 so, when those words appear in similar context, they should share. Uh, uh, they share semantic meaning, and you want to capture the semantic meaning. Uh, there are two types of approaches uh, to kind of deal with words in in a in a classification pipeline in analytics, right? And uh, one is uh, count based, and you've already uh, seen uh, how the I don't know. Uh, in your previous classes, you might have seen something called the bag of bag of words representation, and as well as the uh, one hot encoding of uh, words. So here, uh, when you want to capture, uh, uh, so when you want to create, let's say, representations of words, in a sense, let's say you had a dictionary. Uh, sorry, you had uh, you had a text. Uh, you have you have lots of text data, from which you have let's say uh, twenty thousand words. You know that's your vocabulary. Then for each of the word, you want to assign uh, a number or a sequence uh, or a bunch of numbers. So we want to assign, let's say, a vector, right? Because we can't really work with characters. What do characters really mean? 
so uh, because uh, so we want to assign basically a vector now the count based uh, methodologies what they do is they kind of look at uh, in a in a sentence so so if we have 20000 uh, words in a vocabulary so we actually can uh, we can actually create a matrix which is 20000 cross 20000 And let's say we pick a word. Uh, uh, so let's say this is the i, i comma j. Uh, i comma j is just the index of the ith word and uh, index of the jth word in our vocabulary. So let's say I ordered my vocabulary according to the dictionary order. Okay. Then let's say I just count the number of times j appears in the vicinity of i. Okay. So let's say the word stock. Uh, appears, so let's say stock is the word J and uh, option is the word I and stock appears in the vicinity of option many times let's say in your, in, your, in your text then you'll count the number of times it appeared next to it. Okay. So there's just a integer a number that you put in which says uh, how many times J was uh, kind of close to I in, in your text. Okay. So once you get all these counts you can actually just uh, do PCA which is just a single value decomposition. Right. So you can create a low rank uh, decomposition of uh, of this matrix. So, for example, this is twenty thousand cross twenty thousand. So this would be twenty thousand cross, let's say, three hundred. Uh, let's say this is three hundred cross twenty thousand. Some some rank I chose, which is very very low. But uh, so once I create this, uh, I can actually think of these uh, row vectors as word representations. So that's what I mean by count-based methods, which kind of capture uh, uh, semantic information between words. But we are going to focus on what is called prediction-based methods, and uh, uh, we'll we'll create these uh, word vectors. So last time we saw, so last time we saw uh, word embeddings, or uh, uh, precisely the definition is uh, we want a mapping which takes each word and outputs a outputs a vector. And uh, it's going to be parametric in the sense uh, it has parameters which we can tune to create that function, which defines that function. Uh, we just randomly said uh, let n be 300, and uh, we said let's say if, if university is passed into this uh, function, it outputs a vector, and if class is passed into this function, it outputs a vector. Those two vectors hopefully are close. Let's say compared to a completely unrelated uh, topic. Okay, like fine, uh, I don't know. Um, so, so how do you learn an embedding? Uh, last time we said, okay, we're going to initialize. Uh, uh, we don't know what this vector should be, what representation a word should have. So let me randomly put some numbers there. But we can actually now change those vectors uh, such that uh, the embedded vectors are meaningful for a task. So that's what I mean by a predictive way to capture the semantic meaning, a semantic relationship between words. Um, so, more precisely, I said, okay, pass each word to uh, through my current W. Let's say W is, has assigned all random vectors. It doesn't matter. Pass uh, uh, each word through W to get some vectors. Pass these vectors through a classifier. You know, once you have vector representation, these are fixed fixed length vectors. Uh, you can pass it through a classifier and actually do uh, do some classification task. Uh, and then, if you can, you can tune the parameters of the classifier. You can also tune the parameters of uh, uh, the embedding as well, the embedding function as well. And hopefully, once you tune the parameters of W, then the word representations will will capture semantic meaning, as in uh, semantic similarities, as in co-occurrence statistics, which was what I was talking about here. So. So as I said, for you know, let's say if we design a classification task, the classification, uh, the parameters of W and C should be good. Uh, the task itself uh, can be, uh, you know, can be uninteresting or inconsequential because we want to get representations for words, and this was a way to get representations for words. Just like here, I could get a representation for each word by uh, getting the uh, filling the entries of this count matrix, uh, where count matrix and, and just factorizing it, I could get a representation vector. Right. Similarly, I want to get a representation vector by tagging along a prediction task. Okay. Um, 
we will see why this is uh, uh, interesting. Um, so let's say we could learn uh, some good uh, embedding, then uh, the quality of the embedding uh, is captured by, for example, if you created a vector for each word, then how do you assess the quality? Let's say we project it down to two dimensions. You know, you can again use uh, SVD or you can use, uh, uh, let's say TSNE, the thing that we, we saw in uh, visualizing convolutional neural networks. So uh, TSNE was just a method to uh, bring down all your high dimensional data, you know, data, data set which included high dimensional vectors to two dimensions. So you just can see how far they are from each other and so on. So, so for example, here you can see all the numbers are together and uh, here uh, weekdays are together or, and then months are together. Okay. And also last time we saw that, for example, uh, if you look at the nearest neighbors of the word embedding, so you know, you, you have a representation of a word as a, as, as a high dimensional vector, you look at the neighbors uh, next to the high dimensional vector, hopefully uh, those neighbors have some semantic relationship, right? So, for example, these are all uh, countries and uh, and stuff. So, so this number just means uh, these are more rare words compared to uh, these uh, this word. And uh, it happens that some uh, many of the word embeddings kind of capture uh, some vector properties. Uh, so they kind of inherit some vector arithmetic, where you can actually uh, for example, if you wanted to know the, uh, uh, so basically they capture the analogy relationships. So, uh, uh, for example, if you wanted to know, if you did not know Rome as uh, being analogous to Italy for uh, when compared to France, uh, Paris being uh, analogous to France, you can uh, subtract Paris and add, uh, oops, uh, okay, one second. Uh, yeah, you should uh, subtract Paris and add uh, Rome uh, to get Italy. Sorry. So, so basically, what I'm saying is, if you represent, look at the vectors for France, Paris, Italy, and Rome, you can get get one of them by knowing the vectors of the others by just uh, adding and subtracting. Okay. If not the exact vectors, you get approximately uh, close vectors. So, so an analogous relationships are captured. Okay. And if you also have embeddings, uh, then you can use the same uh, embeddings for multiple tasks. Okay, and uh, it's one of the important uh, recent uh, advances in uh, uh, in NLP. So if you're using bag of words, if you're using one hot uh, vector encoding of words, then probably you can just uh, use pre-trained embeddings that you get from. Uh, we're going to talk about one of the pre-trained embeddings in detail next. Uh, you can use that and have a better performing uh, NLP based. Uh, analytics pipeline, okay? And we also said, okay, we don't have to embed just uh, one set of words from one language. We can actually embed uh, two uh, words from two different languages and put a constraint that if we already know one one word is uh, similar or has the same meaning in another language, then those two words, or word vectors should be close by. Then you can actually kind of uh, capture, even if you did not know uh, uh, some words, analog, analogous word in uh, the other language, uh, those vectors will be close by. So you can impose the constraint on the words that you know are uh, pairs and you could uh, actually retrieve words which you did not know were pairs but are neighbors of each other and so you could know that those are translations roughly. Okay. So any question uh, about the high level area of embedding because we're going to go into depth with respect to one embedding uh, technique called word to vec any any question okay so now we're going to look at uh, word to vec so how many of you have actually used word to vec in any project or something okay one just one okay so so word to word to vector is actually a technique proposed by uh, google in uh, 2013 and uh, as I was saying earlier, we, we, we are focusing on predictive methods to get vector representations of words, unlike uh, count based methods. So previously, uh, in the last lecture, we, we just created some random uh, classification task. We said we are going to take 5 grams uh, and, and classify whether that 5 gram is a valid uh, you know, phrase or not by uh, you know, creating a negative example where we just randomly replace a word and that will not be a, a 5 gram, right? So we create a classification task. So that was the 
predict to method to get to a word, word representation. So word to vector is very similar. So here also they're going to design a particular predictive method to get to a word representation for uh, for words. Okay. Um, and of course, uh, as I said, in all these vector representations, they should capture their co-occurrence statistics. Like cat and dog, hopefully have similar vectors compared to it's a cat and a house, or you know, cat and uh, a stock option, for example. Um, so it has actually two versions. Uh, one is called the continuous bag of words representation, and one is called the skip gram model. But for both of them, the high-level idea is I want to get word representations. I'm going to create a predictive task. Okay. We'll go through the skip gram model uh, uh, in the subsequent slides, and we'll just see what's the difference with uh, the bag of words uh, version uh, later. Okay. So the actual predictive method is uh, they create a particular simple neural network model to create uh, uh, that embedding W. And uh, so their predicted task, in fact, so last, last lecture I kept C as a black box. I did not say what was the classifier. So here we're going to train uh, a single hidden layer neural network to perform uh, the particular aux auxiliary task. So the classifier is now just a single layer uh, neural network. In fact, the nonlinearity in that single uh, hidden layer neural network is going to be linear nonlinearity in the sense there is no nonlinearity. Okay. So, so what is the task? The task is going to be, uh, so pick a word in the middle of a sentence, pick uh, one of the uh, nearby words at random okay, and make the network learn the probability of every word in our vocabulary being this nearby word. So what is the input? So the input of this classification pipeline is going to be a word pair, right? Uh, I mean, it's it's not the word pair. So input is going to be one word. Output is going to be, I mean, the ground truth is going to be another word, which is nearby. And uh, we're going to get a bunch of normalized scores. And we want the score for that, that word that we pick to be high. Okay. So when I say nearby, it's essentially, uh, you know, you define according to a window size. For example, two words to the left, two words to the right any of the words uh, is defined as nearby okay so so what exactly are the uh, word pairs of, of my training data uh, so let's say this is a sentence a quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog and uh, let's let's pick this uh, third uh, uh, line so I'll pick this word brown and then I'm gonna look at uh, nearby words so the nearby words are going to be two to the left two to the right and I'm going to create these pairs of words. Let's say brown, the uh, brown quick, brown fox, and the brown jumps. Those are going to be my word pairs. And my prediction, uh, prediction uh, problem or the classification task is going to be I'm going to input brown and uh, the at least uh, in terms of the ground truth, the the classifier or the classifier should be such that it will output a score vector. The vector is going to be the length of your vocabulary, right? Because those are the number of classes. Uh, it it put it should ideally put more uh, probability mass on these words. Okay, that's all. That's the classification task. Um, or actually, I've illustrated it here again. Uh, so you have ten thousand words in our vocabulary. Then the input is a uh, is going to be now we did not so we're going to design a word vector, right? So we haven't yet gotten a word vector. So how are we representing the uh, representing the words? We'll just make a one hot encoding of that vector which is, uh, I explained last time what uh, one-hot encoding was. So wh who doesn't know what one-hot encoding is still? So one-hot encoding is just, if you have 10,000 words, you, you'll create a 10,000 dimensional vector where, uh, let's say it's dictionary ordered words, then the, that coordinate is going to be one for that word and everything else is going to be zero. That's one-hot encoding. And uh, so the input word is uh, going to be 10,000 dimensional. For example, cat would have the cat coordinate one and everything else zero. The true label uh, word, you know, in the word pair is also 10,000 dimensional, right? And so the network has to output 10,000 dimensional score vector. Input is going to be a 10,000 uh, dimensional input, uh, the one hot encoded vector, okay? So those are the actual representations in your classification uh, um, uh, that we, uh, classification method that we set up. So the network output has to be uh, 10,000 scores, uh, which pass through softmax. So therefore, they are, you know, normalized scores are essentially probabilities. Okay. 
And each coordinate is the probability that the particular word is the randomly selected uh, nearby word. So, so diagrammatically, uh, uh, actually you can't see, can you guys see the lines? Okay, uh, basically this is just, uh, since there is only one hidden layer, it's easy to understand. So the input vector is going to be this 10,000 dimensional vector. Uh, you pick some number of hidden uh, neurons. So let's say here we choose 300, okay? And the output uh, is, you know, after passing through these neurons, you'll get a bunch of uh, bunch of scores, which is going to be 10,000 dimensional. You're going to normalize them by doing the e to the power score divided by you know sum of scores, right? So that's the uh, softmax operation. So you'll get you'll get a bunch of uh, prob probability numbers or basically normalized numbers such that they sum up to one. And you want for a given training uh, data word pair uh, if that is the input vector, then uh, the appropriate word should have a high, uh, you know, high probability mass or high normalized score. Okay. And in fact, uh, we are also actually not going to even have any nonlinearity. So, so when there is no nonlinearity, okay. So, when there is nonlinearity, there are two parameters, right? W one, B one, W two, B two that you've seen in your assignments. When I introduce a nonlinear, when when I remove the nonlinearity, uh, do I still need to have uh, two sets of parameters, or can I just have one? Huh? Why is that? No, I mean there is a hidden layer, except the non there is no nonlinearity. Instead of ReLU, think of a linear function. F of x is x. Let's say in a deep network, you remove all the nonlinearities. You make all of them f of x is equal to x. Okay. Instead of ReLU's, you replace them with uh, identity functions, right? Element-wise, it's a scalar function which is y is equal to x. Yes, yes, yes. So uh, basically, the answer is uh, if you don't have the nonlinearities, you can compress, right? It's just a bunch of matrix products. So without nonlinearities, it's just going to be a product of a bunch of matrices, which is again going to be a linear transformation. But here it's essentially actually a linear transformation. But why are we maintaining the uh, separation? Uh, that's because we are going from uh, a 10,000 dimensional space to a 3,300 3, dimensional space, yeah. and then again back to uh, uh, 10,000 dimensional space. So some kind of compression is happening, and which is what we want. Uh, so that's why. Even if we uh, even if we remove the nonlinearities, we have represented it this way. Okay. The objective is, uh, uh, as you have seen, the cross entropy uh, objective or the multi uh, nominal, uh, not multi nominal, sorry, multi class uh, logistic class that you've seen. So here, uh, the objective is going to the objective is going to be maximize the normalized score of the uh, correct uh, correct word. You know, because there was a word pair in the training data, you want to maximize the mass that you put onto uh, that particular coordinate of the score or the normalized score vector where which is the true ground truth. Okay. So if our training data is made of uh, t words and each having a context of uh, let's say a context window of 2, okay, uh, then uh, each word is associated with 4 other words, right, roughly. You know, this is the back of the envelope calculation. So the total training data is going to be 4 times uh, t, right, and the objective is going to be uh, just uh, sum over all my training data. This is what this double sum is doing. So per per word, there are going to be four other words. So for per training data, you just maximize the probability of uh, uh, my target given my input. Okay. Maximizing this is the same as uh, minimizing the negative log probability. So uh, yeah, here I guess it's not the loss; it's the negative of the loss. Any any doubts on this slide? This should be review of the zeroth lecture or first lecture. Okay. So, so what what is the hidden layer? The hidden layer, let's say, is represented by a weight matrix. Uh, is represented by a weight matrix W naught. Okay. I've just chosen W naught because I don't want. To, uh, so we were using W here, right? So let's just call it W naught uh, in general. Uh, so that's the uh, weight matrix which is mapping from uh, which is going in which is mapping from the input to the hidden layer. And uh, let's uh, actually just transpose it, uh, which is 
Now, the hidden layer was 300 dimensional vector. You generally think of vectors as column vectors. Let's transpose it. So, we will get a row, row vector and uh, uh, we transpose the uh, operation as well. Like uh, instead of uh, W naught X, it will be X transpose W, W naught transpose. And let me call that W naught transpose W. Okay, it's just a transpose of W naught. It's the same way it vector I'm just looking at uh, it from by just transposing it. Okay. The number of rows of W is going to be 10,000. The number of columns of W is going to be 300. And the rows of W are actually our word vectors. We are just going to call them, you know, it's by you know, we are defining them to be the word vectors. Okay. So, as I said, you know, in the predictive um, method approach of figuring out word representations, uh, you know, we created a predictive task which was that one hidden layer neural network and uh, without nonlinearity. Uh, we trained, we created, uh, you know, our training data. We, we trained, let's say, and figured out uh, the weights of the hidden, uh, you know, weights uh, on the hidden side as well as on the softmax side. And uh, now we just transpose the weights of the hidden side. And uh, we're calling, uh, calling the rows of the uh, transpose of the hidden uh, uh, layers weight matrix to be uh, the word vectors. Okay. So we had one hot encoded word before, right? So sorry, there has to be comma. Oh no, this is fine. So uh, let's say the word cat has coordinate C. For some coordinate in in you know one to one, one to ten thousand, let's say our vocab size was ten thousand, right? Uh, if you multiply this uh, one to ten thousand dimensional vector, uh, one hot vector with the uh, with W, it just selects the C throw. You know that's kind of uh, easy to see. Uh, so the output of the hidden layer is actually the word vector, right? Uh, simple operation, and you can actually just see that, right? I mean, if you just multiply this with this matrix, then you just pick this particular row. Uh, and output of the network is a bunch of uh, normalized codes, I, uh, which is you know probabilities. So, uh, which I said, as I think I've repeated this, they denote the probability that this word is the nearby word. Uh, so, for example, if you pick the word uh, uh, word vector for let's say a word called ants, you know, there's a representation for the word ants, and you sorry, pick pick the output uh, neuron, pick the output neuron for the word car. So what do I mean by pick the output neuron? If you remember, I have 10,000 dimensional score vector. Each coordinate is actually a neuron, neuron's output, right? Uh, pick, pick uh, uh, let's say one of those neurons, which represents the car coordinate. Uh, that will have, that vector, uh, that neuron's input uh, will, will have 300 weights, actually. Uh, because uh, mapping from the hidden layer to the uh, uh, scores is actually, uh, so each neuron in the uh, the scores layer uh, will will be connected uh, to uh, will be connected to each of the hidden neurons, right? So that's why there will be three hundred numbers associated with each neuron. So let's pick the cat neuron, and there will be three hundred numbers. Uh, you just multiply the cat uh, features with the uh, uh, with the word vector for ants. That's the same dimension, and then you're basically doing the soft softmax operation to get whether ants is close to uh, car or not. Right, so that's what's happening uh, uh, inside, and and so if uh, two different word vectors have similar context, uh, then uh, these words are likely uh, words that are likely to appear around. Uh, uh, sorry, if two <laughs> if two different uh, words have similar context, then similar words are going to be uh, you know appearing around them, and then the output probability vector should be similar, right? Uh, and, and for if output vectors have to be similar, then the word vector should be similar because it's a linear transformation, you know. Uh, and since the inputs are, uh, are one hamming distance apart, so similarity has to be captured at the level of word vector level, right? Because uh, if you think of similarity at the one hot encoding level, uh, they're all the distance, let's say, you know, hamming distance is just uh, how many coordinates are different. So hamming distance is all one for, for cats versus dog. And cat versus ants versus cat versus house. So there's no information there. Because the output probability vector has to be uh, same, uh, right? So very similar. So the word vectors are similar. So that's one way to you know give intuition about why why this particular task and why call the 
uh, rows of your hidden matrix weight vector as the word, word vectors. Okay. So words like uh, university and masters would uh, have uh, similar context, uh, so similar word vectors and uh, you can also uh, handle uh, semi uh, which means like words like car and cars will have similar vectors if you just leave them in your in your input okay so stemming is just a method to kind of get rid of uh, uh, these duplicate rough, rough duplicates okay uh, so in practice uh, what happens is uh, the network is relatively large because there are two weight matrices and each weight matrix has uh, these many parameters right uh, yeah three million parameters uh, each so you need a lot of data to train and uh, and so people use some engineering tricks to kind of figure out these uh, this this word word to vector vector representation of words. Uh, one thing is to kind of subsample uh, uh, frequent words. So you, you may have too many word pairs where the first the you know the input word is going to be on the okay. This is an article, so uh, you kind of delete them proportional to how frequent they are. So you can you can do that because you have frequency statistics of how many of, of each of the words in your vocabulary, you can easily com compute that. Uh, you can also treat common phrases as uh, single words. For example, New, New York is, is, is actually two words, but you can actually uh, merge them together and uh, call it a single word. There's another thing, because the output probability, uh, output probability is actually a vector which is 10,000 dimensional, it's uh, hard to do that summation. Uh, 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 you have to expand, you, you have to, uh, not just how to do the summation, you actually have to propagate the uh, uh, gradients to all the coordinates of both the matrices, two matrices that you have. So instead of that, uh, uh, there's a trick where they only update uh, the weights of neurons corresponding to uh, you know, randomly chosen non-nearby words. So uh, <coughs> these are sampled inversely proportional to their frequency, but uh, the idea is that you don't propagate and change entries of all the, uh, all entries of your matrix. So you have you have those three million entries, right? So you only change a few of them. You can do that by not considering uh, uh, the error induced by all the non-nearby words, but you just randomly pick a sum of, some of the non-nearby words and try to uh, ensure that they are close to zero in terms of the normalized probability mass. I don't know if you, uh, if that's clear, but it's just an optimization trick. I mean, if you really are at this scale, then you may wanna uh, look into this uh, trick, okay? So in particular, the uh, uh, the Google's word representation, they had uh, uh, okay, the vocab size is 3 million, but uh, I think these are word pairs uh, or, oh, okay, uh, you have, sorry, not word pairs, but the, you can just concatenate and get the data set, right? So how, many, how, how long is the data set? So 100 billion words from that data set and uh, the vocab size is just uh, 3 not just, but it has. It is pretty huge. Uh, Three million words, and uh, and you can actually look at uh, what were the what are the words. You know, many of the words are actually just two words uh, concatenated, and uh, you can actually look at you can actually look at the uh, uh, the word the word representations. Actually, there's a package called Jensen. So uh, I'll encourage you to try that. You can just import uh, Jensen, and you can actually download. Uh, uh, the word vector, which is again pre-trained uh, embeddings, right? So these are these are available uh, online. Uh, you can load it, and you can kind of look at. Uh, for example, here I'm just looking at. I think uh, most similar just means most uh, highest inner product with this word. Okay. So you can see even bad has a higher inner product with this word because it's in the same context, right? You will use good and bad in the same context, let's say in movie reviews or sentiment or something like that. Um, that was so. The task that Google chose was uh, uh, picking two words, picking a word, and picking a nearby word to be the target. Uh, there's a different version of the same problem uh, in the word to vec family, uh, which is called the uh, continuous <coughs> bag of words representation, where instead of uh, picking a word and picking a nearby word as the target, uh, they'll actually do the inverse operation. So they'll pick the nearby words as the as the input and try to predict the target. So we were saying, so yeah, actually we were saying, pick a word and try to predict each of the targets. So we created, let's say, if we had a window size of two, we, we, we had created four training examples, right? So here uh, we would have uh, one training example. So all the four words would be input and uh, 
uh, we want to predict uh, this uh, uh, the target word it just reverses the input and output basically um, there's also another popular uh, embedding called glow which kind of captures uh, which kind of does a multi objective optimization of uh, this predictive method and uh, the count based uh, factorization thing that i was talking about earlier which is one of the previous techniques to capture semantic relationship uh, so you can also download glow based representations uh, which have been trained on a slightly different data set i think uh, so you can use these pre-trained representations in case you you have small data and you want to represent words. Okay, it's better than doing one hot encoding for sure. Uh, any questions at this point? Okay. So next we'll look in look at uh, uh, sequence to sequence learning. So again, uh, revisiting the revisiting the idea that we kind of uh, brought up last time. Uh, that we in the first uh, four classes we were looking at just uh, fixed input fixed output uh, classification problems and now we want to look at sequences because uh, time series is a sequence um, you know text is a sequence uh, video is a sequence of frames and so on so so this is a slide from before um, let's uh, slowly start so let's say we want to do sentence classification you know we we are we are Last lecture we were looking at text applications. This lecture also we're going to ma majorly spend time on text. So let's say we want to do sentence classification. Okay, input is a sequence of words, a sentence, uh, which could be variable length, right? It can, you know, a sentence can have five words, uh, fifty words, uh, and the output is a, let's say class label, which is fixed. For example, it could be sentiment classification. So you're just uh, trying to figure out the sentiment of this uh, this input sentence. Okay, so what is the simplest thing uh, you can do, uh, which I've written here, is that you can ignore the sequence, create a bag of words representation, uh, and uh, and then just treat that input as a fixed length uh, vector and uh, and map it to a fixed size input, fixed size output classification problem. Okay. So how many of you already know bag of words representation? Because we have kind of <coughs> ignored that it's one of it's uh, it's one of the traditional ways to represent uh, you know text data so how many of you don't know bag of words representation okay uh, so bag of words representation is uh, very simple so if you have a cap size of uh, let's say 20000 or 10000 let's say 20000 then you just create a uh, 20000 or <coughs> Let's say 20,000 one. One for if let's say you don't have. Okay, let's say 20,000 uh, cross one, and you just uh, just uh, put ones. It's basically a sum of uh, word uh, one hot vectors. So yes. Uh, so let's say uh, school appeared once. Then you just put one there. Uh, let's say uh, university appeared uh, two times. You just put two there. So that's a bag of words representation. Um, so you can. I mean, each quadrant is going to be integer but it's a vector right it's a 20,000 dimensional vector which kind of captures the sentence what you're losing is basically a sequence right there is no information once you get this you can't get back the sentence uh, and there's also no semantic information so it's just uh, whether the school coordinate was here or there it doesn't matter okay there's no uh, school specific information being captured in that vector okay so then once you get this vector you have the label you have this vector so it's just straightforward classification problem right um, okay, let's do something slightly different. Uh, so we can actually, since we just looked at uh, word vectors in the previous, uh, you know, 15 minutes or half an hour. So let's take a weighted average of the word vectors as the vector for the sentence. Okay, uh, we still lose word order, but at least uh, we are capturing uh, semantic information. Okay, and again we have a fixed size input and uh, output classifier, right? Any other ideas of how to do sentence classification? Yeah. Uh, see, uh, you can actually learn the weights of how to average, or you can just uh, take a predetermined, just equal weight, let's say. 
do you reduce the vector to a single scalar? No, no. The, there are if you, if a sentence has five words, each word is three hundred dimensional. Then you just sum up the five vectors. You still have a three hundred dimensional vector, right? It's just a very um, straightforward thing to do. The same thing as how we were summing, summing up uh, one hot vectors, right? Instead of one hot vectors, we are summing up the word vectors. At least the word vectors had some semantic information, uh, but word order is uh, not there. And also, it's not clear if you do vector addition, uh, are you losing or retaining semantic information, right? Okay. Very interesting. We're going to look at something called uh, convolutional neural network in the context of natural language processing. So, how many of you remember CNNs? <laughs> I think uh, I had say had the same uh, diagram from before. Uh, so, everybody remember CNNs for images, right? Uh, so, for natural language processing, also. Uh, once once you go from symbols to vectors now you're in uh, you know now you're in uh, number space right so you can actually do a lot of things so uh, people instead of creating you know like here we were not sure whether this made sense even if we had word vectors how do we deal with the word vectors right because we were losing uh, uh, word order relationship and stuff so one line of work which was recent at least uh, you know try to use deep learning techniques was uh, try to use uh, CNNs so but it's kind of not very prominent in 2016, but that's just two years of span. So uh, it may be a useful technique uh, uh, in general. It may not give you the top 2% performance improvement. So convolution, if you remember, is just uh, you know passing a side, you know, uh, uh, moving a filter onto the input. So in fact, it's a, it's typically is a 3D tensor. Uh, you uh, slide it, slide it across a spatial dimension, and you get. Uh, you get a 2D activation map, okay, per filter, right? Any questions on the convolution part? Because we are gonna just assume this. Okay. So, what we already know from images is that our convolution CNNs are CNNs because they are trying to capture location invariance. For example, in the image, you know whether the cat is in the top left corner or the top you know right corner or in the center of the image it doesn't matter we should identify it as a cat so we were trying to capture the local invariance and that's why filters were kind of the if the if it was a first convolution layer which is which is right you know which was at the beginning of your cnn uh, pipeline uh, its receptive field was small right it was only looking at if it was a 3 cross 3 filter it was just looking at a 3 cross 3 block of your input image right so uh, they were trying to exploit location invariance and also, uh, they were trying to exploit uh, composition, compositionality, uh, which just means uh, you can compose uh, at the lower level layers. You have lower type of features like edges and uh, uh, color gradients and so on. And at the more uh, uh, higher layers, you have you compose those edges, for example, to create a pattern which looks like a cat or which looks like a, a shape of a bed or something like that. Whatever is the class that you are you are trying to train on. Okay. So those were the two. Uh, kind of uh, reasons why we uh, uh, used CNNs uh, because we knew such structure existed in uh, the images, right, image domain. Now, what we're going to do is uh, try to make, uh, try to mimic the image type of input. So, we will represent a sentence as a matrix and uh, each row is going to be uh, for one word and simply we're going to just replace we're just going to use the word vector that we had from the from the previous section. Okay, so a sentence is represented as a matrix. That's fine, right? Because every word is anyway the same dimension, so at least they can be uh, concatenated together as ro rows of a matrix, right? Once you have a matrix, then the whole CNN pipeline uh, you can you can pass through, right? It the matrix doesn't have depth, so instead of uh, unlike uh, the images in AlexNet and so on, which had the RBG channels, here you don't have. But otherwise, once you created a matrix, you can just pass it through a CNN pipeline to uh, figure out a class. Again, the score vector, uh, like uh, the CNN pipeline typically has a, a, con a fully connected layer at the end, and the score uh, and the scores can be, you know, for example, here it's, if it's like a positive class versus a negative class or something like that. So, what do you guys think of this? Uh, 
use of a word vectors to make a matrix out of a sentence and then pass it through a CNN pipeline. Uh, yes, yes. So, yeah, there is that issue uh, which is that uh, different sentence pairs, sentence class pairs will have different lengths. So, how are you going to deal with that? So, they should have the same length. So, one engineering trick is to uh, add zero vectors as rows. Uh, what you are trying to capture is at least the local order. So, the rows close to each other are close by in the sentence. That, that is roughly captured, right? Um, so, the convolution, uh, so I am going to explain the uh, convolution operation uh, for these matrix, matrix. What, what is the slight difference with respect to the CNN that you have already seen uh, through this diagram. So, first of all, uh, let us say we have 6 filters, okay. these are filters. So, since our input is a matrix, uh, there is no depth, so there is no filter depth. Okay. But I can choose a number of filters, so I chose 6 as the number of filters. Now, what is the size of the filter? You know, I, I removed the depth, so depth is, you know, gone. Now, there is this, uh, uh, or width and height, a width and height, right? So, let us say, uh, I, 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 let us say I pick heights to be 4 here and then 3 here and 2 here, okay? And I am going to choose uh, width to be the same width as the uh, input matrix width as in the width of the filter is going to be the same as the uh, word vector width okay which is going to be for example 300 dimension now what exactly is the uh, uh, sliding operation happening here is going to be it's like passing this matrix from uh, you know on the first first four uh, four first four cross five uh, part of this and then again uh, the next four cross five part of this so you're sliding from top to bottom okay so, when, when you put this on top of this, you do element wise multiplication, you add them up, you will get one number, right? So, that is the number that you put, put over there. That is what a filter da, did even in CNN, right? How many, uh, since this is uh, this height of this filter is 4 and I have 7 uh, rows here, that is why I get uh, 4 uh, outputs there, okay? Similarly with uh, uh, this, these two filters, similarly with these two filters. So, because the filter sizes are now different, actually uh, somebody asked last time, for CNN filters, filter sizes were, were the same, uh, here the filter sizes are different, you will get uh, different uh, length outputs, right? Filter outputs are going to be, uh, yeah, filter outputs are going to be actually just vectors and here the filter output is 4 dimensional, uh, here the filter output is actually 5 dimensional, here it is 6 dimensional, okay? So, I am I, supposed to get 2D activation maps for uh, in, in the regular image based CNN. Here I am getting uh, one dimensional activation maps, and I am getting the number of activation maps is 6 because I have 6 filters. Is that clear? Okay, then uh, I am going to do something called 1 max pooling, okay, because I only have one dimension. Uh, I could have uh, done a max pooling where I take 2 entries and compress it to 1, but I am going to actually compress the whole vector into one, into one. Okay. And same thing with the second filter, same thing with all these other filters. So, I will get uh, one number per filter. So, I get six, six numbers here. I am just going to append those six numbers and create a vector and pass it to the next page. In, in this case, I am just passing it as a, uh, I am just putting a softmax layer for example. So, six dimensional uh, vector, so six, uh, six dimensional uh, Two, let's say two-dimensional score. Let's say it's a class. It says a positive sentiment or not. Okay. Then I just need to reduce it to two-dimensional score. So it's uh, so this the matrix here would be two cross uh, yeah two cross six plus b uh, passing through uh, yeah passing through a sigmoid nonlinear. So is is this CNN clear for text? Yeah. Yeah. And so on. So it's like the sentence here. Yes. Yes. That's an interpretation. Yeah. From here. But this. So 
uh, I think this paper actually exhaustively tries to figure out what should be these filter sizes and so on. Uh, but yeah, your interpretation is, is fine. So they are trying to, so uh, one of the intuition uh, is that uh, if there are, if there, if there is a, if there are words which are far away in a sentence, uh, but uh, sorry, uh, if there if there are words far away in a sentence, uh, but they kind of determine the sentiment of of that sentence. For example, it's a positive review or a negative review. Then, uh, yeah, this type of uh, uh, having a filter detect different regions is uh, is is helpful. Uh, but uh, yeah, these are capturing locality. Uh, but as they are sliding along, they are capturing. Uh, uh, even if they even if the words are far away, they can they can lead to the same sentiment. That's some intuition there. But uh, yeah, what what you said is that's it. That I don't know what else you can interpret from beyond that. Uh, I was talking about compositionality. So if there are far away far away features which get detected by the filters, then they kind of uh, get. Uh, Kind of trigger the next uh, neuron or whatever, and, and kind of give you a positive class, right? Yeah. So if there are two words, one word is negation of the next word. Yeah. Somehow, that thing has been captured. The negation of the word. Uh, word order is being captured here, right? So, yeah, these filters have to capture that. Actually, if there is a word. Uh, if there are two words, so if there is a modifier which is a negation of the of a particular word, then then these filters should capture that. Ideally, the weights are weights supposed to be such that they capture that. Um, yeah, actually, there is not much intuition actually why a CNN would work well, but uh, people have observed that it is computationally fast because uh, CNNs means uh, GPUs, matrix multiplications. Uh, it's very fast. Uh, at the same time, it remarkably gave really good results in uh, back in uh, you know two years ago on a variety of uh, uh, NLP tasks. So people are using it. But you know, so CNN story is that that's it. Uh, but we can also use RNN, right? So we just saw RNN a uh, few slides ago, and if we have a sentence, I can I can take the first word or the word representation, pass it through my RNN. Uh, Output the uh, state, or you know, if it's a cell state, cell state, or if it's just a vanilla RNN, just a hidden uh, HT, uh, pass it to the next stage, uh, pass the next word representation, concatenate them, pass it to the tanish layer like this, uh, pass it forward, and at the end, I can uh, just output uh, output the class. You know, if it's a two-class problem, uh, let's say positive sentiment versus negative sentiment, then uh, that should be the output here. Okay. So we can use an RNN. That's evident, or or no? So, for sentence classification, what I'm trying to say is that uh, you could have used fixed input, fixed output representation. So the CNN or bag of words or whatever. Uh, one variation of that was a variable length input and a single single output. Which is what uh, the sentence classification would map to if you use a RNN based uh, technology, right? Uh, RNN based framework, then you have variable, variable length input and a single output. So that's uh, that's what I wanted to kind of uh, allude to for this this example. Okay, and the way you train it is the same way uh, I've been mentioning earlier, right? You have to do the backward propagation, except that, for example, if it's if if it's an RNN structure like this, then all these have the same weights, uh, and so the gradient update will have to first you need to get do the backdrop all the way to the input and then uh, get the gradient update that you're going to do in each each step right so you do a forward pass so for example training example would be a sentence and its class you pass the sentence forward get the class see the difference of the class from the predicted class uh, you'll have a loss value right uh, let's say it's a cross entropy loss or you know even mean square error or something like that then uh, then you pass the gradient of that with respect to the weights, with respect to its input. Uh, uh, then gradient of the its input with respect to sorry, <coughs> with respect to its input. So you have to pass the gradient to get, get the final uh, gradient value that you that that you're gonna do uh, as you you know uh, your gradient descent on. Okay, is that clear? Is the length of this 
Uh, yeah, yeah. So length of this is the same. So there's the issue. I said variable length inputs. So each sentence can have arbitrary lengths, right? So how are you gonna deal with that? So as I said, the engineering trick is to pad. So so you let's say you have a data set from a, a movie reviews. So most so let's say the sentence length varies from five to hundred. That's a short movie reviews. Then one uh, very naive thing you can do is actually create a hundred uh, copies of this because that's the max length of your data set, right? Um, or you can actually just, uh, so, I mean, create a 100 length RNN and actually pad uh, zeros for the subsequent inputs, zero vectors, right? Uh, word vectors. Or you can just actually, uh, per example, you can actually do this computation, right? Per example, I know if, let's say an example has five words, then I just have to repeat this computation five times and do the backward prop uh, for that and uh, get the get the weight the weight is you know is indifferent of the length of the of this network right it's the same weight uh, you know the, let's say if it's a tannish layer if it's a vanilla RNA it's just the same sing, single weight matrix and the bias that need to be updated whether the sentence length is 5 or 100 it's the same uh, it's the same is there any confusion there No, it's not. I think uh, in the previous lecture as well as this lecture's beginning, I said it's the same weights, right? So it's a uh, it has less weights than let's say your CNN, for example. If it's just one Danish layer, then there's just one matrix. Uh, and maybe uh, you know if, if there's a softmax layer here, then there will be another uh, one, another matrix which maps to the scores, right, or something like that. Uh, other than that, you don't have you don't have multiple weights. You'll have more weights if you purposely want to have different weights, right? You can always do that. Or if you have typically, if you have more layers, you know, I said you can stack uh, same unit, same uh, unit on top of uh, this, where the where the where this one's output is also going as input to the next uh, RNN. Then you you can have different weights, different uh, parameters for that that uh, layer okay but this layer will not have different weights so roughly the notion of layer is different here but yeah this one is the same no the values of weight vectors like if you already train this rnn w is fixed right it's just that your hts are going to be different right these this is ht or ht minus 1 ht whatever Any other question? Uh, so let's look at uh, another example. Uh, so this was the example that I think I skipped over very quickly last time. Uh, this is the image captioning example. Uh, so here I'm just giving this example which is different from sentence classification because sentence classification you could have fitted into a regular fixed input, fixed output uh, uh, pipeline. Here, you know, it's not clear, right? Unless you want to output a single word for the image, uh, you can't really caption an image uh, 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 using fixed input, fixed output representation, uh, fixed input, fixed output pipeline. So what we're going to do is what what you've already done in an assignment. So we're going to, in this case, I think this is a, probably an AlexNet uh, 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 version. So we're going to get rid of the last softmax and maybe even the last fully connected layer and get a 4096 dimensional vector. Okay. So that's going to be the representation of the image. Okay, again now it's a vector. Um, then we're going to input that vector as the input to your RNN. So your RNN had, uh, uh, let's say, uh, your RNN's uh, input, let's say, first input is always going to be a default. Let's say it's a, it's a start. Okay, it's a start vocabulary, some, some word representation, some, yeah, word vector representation for the uh, token start. Okay, it's not a per part of your vocabulary, but you can always give a word vector, or maybe you can put zeros there. It doesn't matter. Okay. Uh, now this vector uh, was the previous uh, input to that uh, uh, RNN, right? So the HT minus one is this this vector. Okay, uh, and then I'll get uh, I'll try to uh, uh, I'll I'll get a Y naught. Okay. So the only change is uh, there's a new 
additional v there and uh, let's say h the usual h which can be a different dimensional than v i am just setting it to 0 okay um, then what i'm going to do is uh, this y since it's it's supposed to do image captioning the output is supposed to be uh, a word or a, uh, the output is supposed to be a word so it has to be uh, the output has to be uh, uh, if your vocabulary size is 10000 the output has to be 10000 dimensional right that you agree okay so the output is going to be a distribution over uh, word indices essentially right so and then you're going to sample from that uh, distribution maybe you'll get a word let's say straw in this case uh, conveniently it's straw uh, then you're going to use that as the uh, input uh, to your next stage of your uh, rnn okay so i'm constructing the rnn in a sequence uh, although i mean i could have displayed it in one one shot so i'm going to take the output here uh, i'm going to get a score vector a normalized score vector which is going to be the probabilities from which i'm going to draw an uh, index and get its word vector representation and i'm going to use that as input here okay and i'll pass uh, that input to the rnn block for example it could be this vanilla rnn block uh, get the previous uh, hidden layers uh, uh, vector as well concatenate and uh, transform like this and get another output that's going to be again uh, a normalized score vector okay again uh, that that will be 10000 dimensional because my vocabulary is 10000 dimensional i'm going to uh, let's say i sample that and it happened to be hat uh, then again uh, i'm going to pass that as the input uh, i'm going to do this till my output prediction uh, i can sample a sample a word from the output which happens to be the end token which is not in the vocabulary but is a special token uh, okay uh, if it samples an end token i stop my uh, generation procedure generation of this caption okay is that is that clear how i'm going from uh, uh, a fixed input which is a single image it's not changing right uh, but a variable length output which is going to be the description of that image you should always keep in the back of your mind that i actually will need image and uh, strings basically sentences or phrases a, lo a lot of them to actually train this network because uh, let's say even if I use a pre-trained network, I actually have to tune the uh, uh, the W and B of, of these these guys to have good uh, good uh, uh, captioning in in test time, right? But you can do it. theoretically if you have a lot of data, you can actually do this and you'll have good results. I mean, of course, uh, if you can train it well, uh, which depends on the RNN architecture, and that's why we were looking at uh, LSTMs rather than vanilla RNNs. Okay. So is this example clear? Okay. Now let's look at uh, another example, uh, which uh, is called auto reply. So, I mean, it's a part of a bunch of applications where we have variable length inputs and variable length outputs. Okay. And I think uh, in the in one of the slides before, I already said machine translation, where you have a, a <coughs> sentence in English, you want to get a sentence in uh, Japanese, right? Uh, then those two would be different length uh, uh, input output uh, representations right uh, input output pairs uh, there's also other uh, applications like summarizing you have a huge document your output has to be uh, a small you know collection of sentences then then they have variable length input variable length output because the document length is not pre-specified and neither is the summarization length pre-specified uh, same thing with speech transcription right um, <coughs> Speech transcription is interesting because I can say something slowly, I can say something very fast. So input length, if you actually think of in, in terms of time, it's arbitrary. And the output is going to be, you know, whatever the text translation of whatever I spoke. And you can also do question answering. Questions can be arbitrary length. Um, answers, has to be, answers can also be arbitrary length. So all these are applications of variable length inputs, variable length outputs. And it's amazing that with such very interesting uh, uh, non-integral uh, you know uh, data you can create uh, uh, these prediction pipelines okay so what is uh, what is auto reply i mean this is uh, something i got from uh, uh, one of the google brain researchers so uh, auto reply is a feature where the computer reads your email and responds appropriately okay so in this case uh, there's a particular request that somebody wants to join 
uh, there's an email saying we want to join for uh, dinner and there's already a reply so these are the outputs of your RNN so this is right here input and uh, it has given some bunch of outputs in, in, in this in, you could always output one you can output also more more replies right so that's why is here is an example with three replies but uh, this is an example of variable length input variable length output okay and it's not really uh, very uh, complicated uh, how we get to this point uh, we've already seen uh, RNNs right so we can we can do the following right so let's say there were n tokens uh, which just like before then I can just uh, pass the word representation for h1 uh, get uh, and get the hidden vector uh, a hidden layer vector uh, pass the representation for how, you know how uh, do let's say this type of uh, concatenation uh, transformation nonlinear transformation get the hidden vector here uh, do that you know up to let's say the end of my end of my variable length input I get the end token at which point I need to start uh, generating an output right in this case it happens to be since it's out to reply I need to generate words so appropriately I'll, I'll define the uh, you know the softmax layer and the number of scores you know score dimension everything right uh, here also note that for example here uh, the ones in the white I'm just uh, the reason why they are in white is because they all share the same parameter the same w and b and the ones in the red I, I'm just assuming that they may have different parameter okay so some different w prime b prime okay and the way uh, yeah So one problem with this version is, like in the image captioning, I said uh, we're gonna pass the first uh, first output as input here, so that it kind of has some contiguity, right? Uh, here it's just uh, generating the sentence on on the fly, so it's as if it's a, it's a really look good language model. So it's generating the sentence without looking at, so like it has to generate times without knowing, uh, without with by only knowing the input which is the hidden uh, layer vector here, but not knowing what was generated here, okay? Maybe I sampled I am here, but uh, I am is just one option, let's say uh, the other most likely option was D, let's say, or, or some other common word. Then then while, while making a prediction fine or thanks, I'm not seeing that. So one slight modification is that I take that input and uh, whatever I sample there, I'm gonna take that input here, okay? We saw this in image captioning example as well, right? Um, yeah, so all, all this change is that we feed back the uh, true output uh, at each stage uh, as input uh, to the next stage. And I think the terminology that they use is uh, this part is an encoder till, till you reach the uh, uh, end of the input. And this part is going to be decoder which starts uh, spitting out the uh, response or the output. Okay. So as we saw uh, with image captioning uh, example, uh, so given input sequence x, we first output y naught, you know, uh, which uh, uh, so we can actually we can do it deterministically. We can output y naught, which has the highest probability. Then given x and y naught, we output y one, which has the highest probability, and so on. So these are there are many strategies to generate, you know, what is the most likely prediction, right? You you don't have to sample uh, like I was talking about in the image caption, captioning example. Right. So, is, is this procedure clear of uh, what's happening? There is no sampling here. This is just deterministic. I got a score, normalized score vector. Whichever coordinate is the highest, that's my prediction. I am, for example, I'm gonna input that in the next uh, stage, pass it through the uh, RNN block, uh, get another bunch of uh, normalized score vectors. Uh, whichever is the highest, let's say, uh, that's the output at that stage. That's that's clear, right? Um, the issue is uh, it does not correct for mistakes. So. What we actually do is uh, 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 what's suggested and uh, is is an industrial practice uh, is something called uh, beam search decoding. How many of you have heard of beam search before? Okay. So beam search uh, decoding is uh, is a very simple idea, uh, straightforward idea where instead of being uh, picking the most likely you know picking the output picking that coordinate which has the highest probability right in the normalized score version of it uh, you pick uh, k of them k uh, 
highest probability coordinates of your normalized core vector and then keep uh, remember them in the next stage uh, you pass all k of them and get uh, for each one of them uh, you can get uh, potentially let, let's say in this example I, I'm passing three I'm, I'm retaining the three most highest uh, uh, possible outcomes uh, in the first uh, stage and then for each one of them I can get another three more possible outcomes so what I'm going to do now at any given stage is uh, for multiply the probabilities and see and then again sort them according to which one is the highest joint probability now okay and uh, I'm going to just truncate the number of uh, things that I see uh, to be of uh, size k okay. in the sense for example if I had 3 uh, next stage I would have 9 next stage I would have let's say 27 right uh, let's say I have a threshold k of 10 then I'm only going to retain uh, uh, 10 such sequences so so high was followed by how maybe it's highly likely but uh, please come was not likely uh, so it was maybe the 27th one here and maybe uh, high, high followed by how was the first one here then the 27th one guy, guys, guy gets uh, removed from my candidate set of outputs that's all okay that's called beam search uh, very straightforward technique okay um is this is this clear yeah uh, yeah these are all uh, you can use uh, word to vec that we just discussed uh, in the last uh, session i mean a few slides ago right all these are vector representations once you have vectors you don't really care about whether that object was a word or whether that object was an image or uh, even a program or a tree or whatever yeah is that clear okay uh, so one there's one issue with the uh, second version that we made even if we do beam search and whatever okay that is that the link between the encoder and the decoder uh, in this uh, RNN uh, framework is that there is only one link which is this HN okay HN is the one which is somehow capturing all the aspects of your input right that that vector here uh, so this uh, I'm, I'm representing the vector which is inputting here as HN let's say or, or the output of the tran local transformation uh, so HN is going to capture everything uh, that's happened before it and it's a fixed length, length, fixed length vector so if I had seen a five word sentence you know that would be captured as a that's a 300 dimensional vector hn if i had seen a 100 word sentence before it's still captured as a 300 word vector right uh, sorry 300 length uh, vector or whatever 400 length vector uh, whereas input is variable length so it's maybe it's not you know it's not capturing uh, the richness of your uh, input okay so one way to uh, get around it is uh, a very fairly recent <coughs> technique uh, which is called attention mechanism. Okay. I think uh, the last lecture, yeah, in the last lecture I had a, a slide where I was showing that uh, there was an example where there was an image captioning example, except that, uh, uh, was it an image caption? Okay, there was an example where uh, the network was trained to look at only parts of the image and then output uh, a number, right? So okay let's look at attention mechanism here uh, so in the third version the attention mechanism is going to be as follows so what I'm saying is that the uh, output should consider atten uh, should consider attention to parts of history in the sense that when I'm when I'm outputting something uh, let's say I want to output uh, something here I should not just look at HN probably I should look at all the processing that has happened before that's roughly the idea and uh, how I'm going to do that is as follows. Uh, let's say I had the opportunity to look at all the outputs of the hidden layers, let's say. Okay. Uh, so instead of, uh, instead of generating, uh, okay. uh, sorry, in this example. So I, I'm saying that, uh, let's say I used HN to generate the first word. Uh, but for the second word, let's say I use IM as an input for the next one uh, although this is somewhat incorrect uh, I should you know the second word should not just depend on the my whatever sample or the most likely output from my first prediction and just HN okay it should look at 
all the all the sequence. Even the first word can look at the whole sequence of hidden layers, right? So uh, the fix is as follows: you don't generate that output first, okay? Uh, from H n, you first generate an uh, intermediate vector, okay, which is C. Now, which could be, for example, a cell state or H H whatever in this whatever is the index here that that output, okay? Now we one fix is let's take the inner product of this vector with all these vectors. Let's say they have the same dimension. We can take inner products somehow, you know, capturing some similarity. Okay, um, that's going to be a bunch of numbers, uh, scalar numbers, which are which is the length of uh, this input. I'm just gonna so these numbers somehow capture the aspect that when uh, this vector has something to do with. Uh, Maybe this stage, this stage, this stage, this stage. They are trying to kind of ensure that something like that is captured. Okay. I'm gonna uh, <coughs> compute a transformation, uh, basically uh, some sort of uh, uh, sum them up with some weights and uh, uh, make it like a gate. You saw the gate uh, in, in the LSTM, right? So this is this is like a gate. I have a bunch of numbers. I'm doing a linear, I'm doing a initially a linear transformation. Uh, 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 I mean, this is a scalar gate, so that's why it's a single number instead of a vector gate, okay? Uh, and then I'm gonna use that gate and and see to make a make a prediction. Uh, that's all. So that that's the uh, fix here. So basically, instead of having, if you had a really long sequence, then you would look at a really long uh, sequence of numbers, and then look at if those sequence of numbers kind of capture something uh, uh, that you wanna kind of predict here, okay? So these are not uh, on the fly computations. So there is actually edges here. I'm just showing diagram diagrammatically as uh, on the fly edges. Um, so so let's look at. Uh, so I, I just changed uh, the application. I just changed the translation. So what exactly is happening? So I, I'm generating something, an intermediate output here. I'm going to look at its uh, kind of. Uh, I'm going to look at. Uh, uh, trying to attend, or I'm trying to look at those parts of input which are highly related to what I should output here. Okay, that's going to be captured by the previous uh, additional bunch of edges or network that I created. Additional edges that I created in the network. Okay, uh, for example, in this case, in this translation example, uh, after the end, I, I I have this intermediate vector, and I see that now I'm supposed to uh, kind of output, let's say, uh, something related to the hidden state of the first stage. Then I'm gonna be more likely to output, uh, let's say, the translation uh, in, in in this case. Uh, same thing with then that's gonna go as the input for the next uh, stage, and then I'm gonna uh, look at uh, before generating this. I'm gonna look at again the inner products and uh, try to see that it's I'm supposed to output something related to this stage and so on. Okay, uh, is that at least uh, operation clear? I mean, the intuition is uh, the intuition is that we are supposed to not just capture, you know. It, this is variable, variable length input, and I should not just depend on the final uh, compressed uh, whatever vector here. You know, whatever vector is output by the encoder. I should also look at all the uh, intermediate, let's say, the hidden layer outputs or the cell states of all these previous uh, blocks. That's all. So when I say uh, look at all of them, in the sense, I, I want I want to focus attention that at this point of time, I should probably focus on some words uh, at the beginning or some words at the at the at the, at the next part. Okay, and that decision is going to happen through some parameters which relate to how my intermediate cell state is uh, tied to all these uh, previous hidden uh, outputs. Okay, so there is a block which I am kind of not putting it as a block because it's uh, it's literally multiple lines are going to that C over there, okay? But uh, what I'm trying to say is, okay, well, the takeaway from at least this last complication, which was the attention mechanism, was that uh, that is something which people are trying to uh, do now, uh, especially to deal with, uh, uh, you know, let's say machine-to-machine -machine translation. You have to really focus on some parts. Let's say you're generating the beginning of a translation, let's say. Uh, let's say you're translating a 100-word sentence, English sentence to... Uh, as a Japanese, when you're creating that translation, uh, the first word or the first few words should focus on some parts of the input sentence. The next few words should focus on the, some other parts of the input sentence, and maybe the last word should fo focus on some other parts. It need not be linear. It need not be that the first words focus on the first uh, first part, 
the second uh, word focus on the second part and so on. It need not be linear, but they're trying to capture that uh, you know very uh, uh, across the units you know relationship instead of having this nice linear block structure where everything goes from left to right and uh, there is no other interaction. They are trying to bring in these interactions by adding more edges. Edges just means uh, weights roughly, right? Um, more parameters into the model. And uh, I'll just, uh, uh, we'll break in two minutes. Uh, I just wanted to finish one more example, which is uh, speech transcription, because it's just, uh, just a variation of the previous uh, uh, family we were looking at. Variable length inputs, variable length outputs. So in speech, uh, I don't know how many of you have already worked with uh, speech data. So typically there are a lot of, there's a lot of jargon. It's a very rich field with uh, uh, 50 years potentially of uh, engineering work, right? Uh, so there's something called acoustic model, which says, okay, if condition on the word, how does it sound? Okay, sound. And uh, language model, which says, what is the probability of a word or a sequence of words? What is the probability that New York, uh, New is followed by York versus uh, what, is, uh, what is the probability that New is followed by uh, Chicago? Okay, right? Uh, so there are two uh, components, which are major components, and a lot of engineering has gone into basically representing this distribution and manipulating this distribution. Uh, same thing with uh, this uh, distribution, okay? Uh, and as I said, even building these blocks and stuff, uh, on top of that, you may want to do a lot of feature en engineering to actually do the speech transcription in the sense going from, uh, you know, going from sound to the words is, uh, is not uh, uh, easy and requires a lot of feature engineering. But under, under this framework, this new generation framework of sequence to sequence learning, you can actually attempt to do end to end as in go directly from speech as a sequence of speech signal, you know, however you capture it, we'll see in the next slide, to, to a sequence of words, okay? So you kind of eliminate all this uh, intermediate sub-blocks that you've created, you know, which were interpretable before. You had a sub-block which, uh, which would be acoustic model, which would be a la language model. Uh, you'd have like maybe identify something called phonemes, which are these uh, basic units of sounds. So there was this, all this uh, complicated stuff happening here. And uh, uh, one attempt, uh, one recent attempt uh, use, is to use uh, this uh, deep learning uh, building block RNNs to uh, kind of do this end to end. So it's the same as what we saw in auto reply, but with one minor modification, which is, you know, your speech signal is actually a bunch of numbers. Uh, Okay, it's actually just a waveform. A waveform is a bunch of numbers indexed by time. So for example, uh, you may have a 8 kilohertz or a 16 kilohertz speed signal. All it means is that in one second, I took 8,000 uh, 8, numbers, you know. It's just a, a bunch of sequence of 8,000 numbers in one second, a bunch of sequence of 8,000 numbers in another second. That's a 8 kilohertz as a speed signal, okay. It's a bunch of integers, let's say. Uh, and that's what is represented here. So. It's a, it's pretty dense, uh, but uh, these are all let's say integers or some scale versions of that. So one preprocessing that you do is uh, uh, you know it's not clear how to deal with uh, you know it's it's a sequence of uh, integers. It's not a vector, right? Uh, so what we're going to do is we actually are just going to convert it to vectors and then put them into uh, our sequence to sequence model that we saw earlier. So we're going to take a small block of. Uh, uh, of the speed signal, which is one dimensional. Uh, we are gonna create, a, we are gonna transform this and create a feature vector for this, which is called uh, a spectrogram or some, there are fancy variants called MFCC features or something like that. Uh, so that's straightforward, that's well known and it's a simple transformation, okay. Uh, you do that transformation and that's it, you have vectors. So from, from one, this one dimensional, let's say 20 millisecond uh, strip of signal, you get a, a vector, let's say it's a, a vector dimension is let's say 30, 30 dimensional or 60 dimensional, you know. It's a representation of this uh, time domain component, okay. Uh, you have 30 dimensional vector here, 30 dimensional vector here, 30 dimensional vector here. You create all those vectors and that's your sequence of uh, uh, input vectors. That's your input sequence. And and then you you do the same uh, same thing as we, what we saw. Maybe you will add another RNN layer on the top. You can do that and you can get rid of this you want to and, and the same thing after the sequence uh, you start uh, try, trying to predict uh, the uh, text okay uh, there are a lot I mean this is the high level idea so there will there are some challenges even with uh, this as well because here you can see that there is too much 
you know, the sequence length for the same output can be very different, right? I can say something very slowly, say something very quickly. So, uh, yeah, so those, there are many considerations like that. And this is not the state of the art model right now, but uh, even the, that simple framework of sequence to sequence learning with RNNs, you know, you can, you can potentially do this, okay? And there's an equivalent uh, thing uh, uh, that Baidu, uh, uh, Baidu research has uh, come up with, uh, which also has RNNs, uh, but it's a slightly <coughs> different structure than sequence to sequence modeling that we are seeing here, okay? Uh, any questions for this part? Okay, let's take a quick break and uh, we'll get back. I think today's can be. I noticed you mentioned about the image capture link. Yes. I was wondering, uh, can I use that on the video ca capture link thing? So basically, it's a. Uh, I'd be thinking, what's the problem? But it's so because I know Netflix actually hire someone to do like video tagging, so basically like like making a little tag work by watching a long time of movies. Yes, yes. yes. Can machine learning do that? Also? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but it's difficult, uh, especially because these are high dimensional data. Right? Okay. okay. It can be done for really short clips. Really short clips, you can. Because basically, we do just like uh, like frame by frame stack together. No, no. Uh, that's that's also possible, but there are ways to do it slightly better. But the very naive way is what you are suggesting, straightforward frame by frame. Okay. Tagging. And um, also the VTGNX. So based on what I'm understanding, it's basically it's like uh, it's so good that like we can put in any image and then with some minor tweak it will, it will produce high uh, accuracy, is that correct? Almost any image. Uh, I'm just like high level. It can be used that, you can use that for any, uh, uh, like if you if you have let's say some subset of images that you want to yeah. build a classifier for, you can use that as a feature extract that we discussed in the class. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, because you may not want the same class label as what you're getting from the image, right? Because there, there's only thousand classes there, uh, which you may not be interested in. So I'm just saying, is that possible in the future? There will be I mean, there will have a, a better model than the VGG. Then we can basically throw. Yes. Yeah, there are better models actually. VGG is from 2013, 2014. Okay. So there are two other models called. Uh, uh, Inception Net by Google and ResNet by Microsoft. Okay. So they are better, but and the weights are also available. Just like you downloaded the 500 MB file for VGG when it's based, right? Same thing you can download for them slightly better, but they are only slightly better. So I don't know if you care about. So in terms of the yeah. application, so um, how could the accuracy? I mean, what's the minimum accuracy you need to be able to achieve? Like 95 percent or any more? No, no, their top one accuracy is quite low, right? Even for the thousand class data that yeah. they have, their best accuracy is about 80%, top one accuracy. Okay. The top five accuracy, if, if they had the option to give five guesses instead of one, okay. then the accuracy is like 97, uh, uh, not 90, okay. 94 or 95, something like that. Uh, but if it's top one, it's lower, much lower. And reaching 80% accuracy in a thousand class data set in, in terms of top one accuracy is very difficult. Okay. Uh, so, in the hurry to submit the report, we kind of forgot to mention the citation. Sometimes we would have picked up snippets of code from one. Like, one example is when we took the code to vectorize the MNIST data set because the data set is in a bad format. Mm -hmm. So, that we took from on open source online repos. Yes, yes, yes. So can we send you the citations later? Because yeah, 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 send it. And, uh, so there are some cases where the, mm -hmm. for example, the MNIST data set, right? The actual data set itself is in mm -hmm. an array, array of arrays yes. to do R maximum. Some people have created CSV versions of it. Is it okay if we use those? Yeah, yeah. It's okay. Reprocess data is fine. Yes, we should.
Particular data set. So I think for a general question, it should be fine. Right? But if it's like a um, say, if we are asking like automobile repair, mm -hmm. and of course, like, mm -hmm. so for that, uh, would that be a correct one or? No, these are word representations. You can try them. Why not? Why do you want to pre retrain something when you try? I mean, try them. If they don't work that well, then then you can train your own word vector representations instead of using like a handbook. Which is like specific to that because directly first. Maybe useful. I mean, you never know. Um, but this is just straightforward. It's just like instead of one hour encoding, just uses vectors. Like yeah. Uh, can you send me? I forgot mm -hmm. to put the citation. Uh, I wanted to send to you or to the TA or just the uh, uh, TA. I mean, we'll see together. But you can send it to me. TA. She's gonna grade. Yeah, but, uh, I mean, uh, I can just put the citation in the mail. Right? So yeah, yeah. yeah, that and in fact, also the seventh one, we forgot to address the number. I really don't remember. So, can I just uh, yeah, send an email as soon as possible? Yeah, I'll just send it. Thank you. Okay, guys, uh, looks like the number of people have reduced. Actually, this is the meat of the class. So, uh, the next part is going to be very relevant for your jobs. You know, in terms of okay, you're learning all these uh, deep learning techniques. You know, are you really gonna you know what's the some design patterns that you need to use when when you're in the job? So okay, so this is actually adapted from. Uh, I mean, you probably all of you know uh, Andrew Ying. Uh, he's uh, he's an adjunct professor right now at Stanford, uh, but leads uh, leads I think uh, Baidu research right now. So he gave some. Uh, Kind of useful uh, uh, design, you know, this you know, design choices that you need to make while uh, running through a machine learning workflow. So it's very useful uh, whether you're in deep learning or not. Okay, so there there are uh, uh, four points that we're going to cover. First is uh, the major deep learning trends in the industry, uh, and then this notion of end-to-end end-to-end deep learning. One of which we just saw. Uh, earlier, right? Sequence to sequence learning is like end-to-end uh, -end deep learning, uh, and there is this notion of bias variance trade-off, which uh, is taught in traditional uh, ML courses, and uh, you might have seen it before. So, it that bias variance theory changes a little bit uh, when you are working with uh, deep learning uh, problems, and then uh, there is this notion of human-level performance. So, when whenever we were talking about ImageNet in the first you know, two three lectures, we said, oh, it's, it's performing uh, uh, ninety four percent uh, with ninety four percent top five classification uh, accuracy, and uh, that's that's beating humans, right? So, so why are we talking about human level performance? Okay, so uh, so major deep learning trend is uh, basically uh, scale, right? Scale is what is behind the success of uh, deep learning today, uh, especially with uh, being able to do really large matrix multiplications, really, you know, billions of matrix multiplications uh, within uh, a short period of time. And uh, uh, scale has a lot of impact on uh, workflow of a machine learning project. So uh, one of the things that you might have noticed is uh, with shallow machine learning models, let's say you pick the SVM family, let's say you already picked a kernel, let's say RBF kernel or polynomial kernel, or, 
uh, or you pick, pick logistic regression, let's say, uh, you'll see that if you even if you add a lot of data, you're not really increasing uh, performance, right? So there's some uh, plateauing which happens uh, for shallow machine learning methods techniques. And uh, maybe if you use, uh, let's say, two-layer neural network, maybe a little bit additional performance because of nonlinearity, let's say. Uh, with medium networks, maybe a little bit more performance. Uh, but with really deep networks, uh, there's really uh, no plateau being observed so far. But it's kind of a cheating because when I say deep nets, you can always increase the model complexity by adding more uh, layers. Uh, so these models are really, really, uh, you know, have a high capacity to kind of, if you don't train them properly, they can pretty much overfit and remember what's in your da training data, okay? Like for example, if you have more parameters than uh, uh, the number of examples are, uh, not just number of examples, but the number of numbers in your examples, then you can pretty much remember the number of number, you know, numbers, but it will not have a good, uh, you know, performance uh, out in the wild, right? So, so, uh, so deep nets uh, can be driven further by getting more data and getting more performance. Uh, so, sorry, if you get more data, you can actually get more performance out of uh, deep net based solutions. Okay, a performance just means uh, whatever it's classification task, it's accuracy and so on. Okay, um, and if you really have uh, small data, then you should probably not uh, try to use any deep net uh, pipeline unless you kind of use them as pre-trained models. So you've already seen how to use a pre-trained uh, VGG network. Um, you've also seen uh, today you've seen word to vec right so you can also download those 300 dimensional vectors that google has provided and try to use those representations if you have really really small text data for example right uh, and uh, in, in at least today uh, uh, the the types of models uh, that we went through in the class are the models which are typically production ready in the sense uh, these technology companies uh, uh, whatever they have deployed, they have mostly used the things that we have covered in this class. Uh, so CNNs, RNNs, and uh, fully connected networks, uh, fully connected uh, fee forward networks. Uh, there are many other uh, non-production ready techniques that you'll see uh, if you search for deep learning on the internet. Uh, you might have heard of, uh, let's say, auto encoders, uh, deep Boltzmann machine, uh, you know, a lot of diff different, different architectures that people have come up with. Uh, even reinforcement learning, uh, they're not uh, production ready in, in the sense that they, are, they have not been productized yet. Um, <coughs> so if you're going to work on deep learning, these, these are good bets. Um, so that's with respect to trends in, in deep learning in the industry. Now with respect to end-to-end -end deep learning, uh, typically in shallow machine learning, uh, we already saw a few instances uh, in this class, like for sentence classification. Uh, Outputs are typically numbers, you know, this these classes, right? Uh, scores for the classes, um, and and for example, sentiment, sentiment classification output is you know number binary zero or one, let's say. Uh, but in deep learning, output can be rich, and uh, it's rich because you have representations for those objects, whether it's uh, images, whether it's words, right? Um, and you can work with uh, sequences, which is uh, you know input is an image, output is a string, machine translation, speech recognition. Uh, so this is what we were going through in the past, uh, you know, 15 minutes ago. Uh, but end-to-end -end deep learning cannot be done always. That's that's the uh, uh, caveat. For example, you know, uh, it's great to learn sequence-to-sequence -sequence learning models today. In the sense, uh, we just saw examples. We didn't really train them, but as a practitioner, you would probably go to TensorFlow's uh, web page, uh, look at some sequence-to-sequence -sequence learning examples, and uh, maybe use that as a tool in your in your. Uh, 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 in your toolkit, right? I mean, you'll, you'll not derive the back propagation equation uh, and all that unless you're doing research. You'll probably use TensorFlow's auto different, automatic differentiation capabilities and so on. So, but when you do that, you can't apply end to end deep learning always. And one very uh, 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 prototypical example is, uh, you know, let's say image to steering action. You can actually think of this as uh, an end to end deep learning, right? Uh, uh, image is a fixed input, uh, steering action is a fixed output, then you can fully, you know, map from uh, image as in let's say a driving a self driving camera is capturing images of what's what's in the front what's in the back what's in the sides let's say four images uh, you can't just do that it's less realistic more realistic is to actually map from images to uh, some detection intermediate uh, uh, intermediate outputs like detect pedestrians at certain locations detect other cars uh, maybe even detect the velocity of the other cars and then uh, f uh, this whole uh, operations research part of it as in uh, planners, which actually plan, 
uh, in terms of how to get around uh, 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 obstacles and things like that. Uh, they need to come into the picture and then only steering control is actuated. So, so don't run after end-to-end -end deep learning uh, methods uh, just because sequence to sequence learning uh, can be thought of as any input, any output, right? Um, but you know, it, it may work if you have lots and lots of data. So if you have like say billions of data points, then uh, you're fine, okay? Um, that's just with respect to end-to-end -end deep learning uh, because we saw a few examples in today's class. Uh, so what to do after training, okay? So let's say you, you trained your uh, uh, two-layer network or one-layer network um, or even five-layer network. Um, what do you do next, okay? You trained, you got some number, performance number. Uh, from that point, you can actually take a lot of decisions to potentially improve or uh, potentially find bugs, right? Overfitting and so on. Uh, how do you take these uh, decisions? And uh, one, uh, at least a managerial or, or, or a, a very practical way of doing this is to look at uh, what is called bias variance trade off. So uh, let's look at this example. Uh, let's say, you know. Let's say in, in Baidu's case, uh, they want to build a human level speech recognition system. Okay, uh, so so they measure uh, three numbers. So uh, uh, they measure the human human performance. Let's say it's one person uh, in terms of uh, 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 recognizing speech. Uh, maybe it, uh, training error. Your training error is going to be five percent. Let's say, and your validation error is six percent. Okay, then. Uh, because there's a gap, higher gap between human level performance and training error compared to training versus your validation, and hopefully validation is proxying your test, uh, uh, this would be called uh, roughly bias. Okay, it's not the same as the bias in uh, classical statistics, but uh, it can be potentially mapped to that. But anyway, uh, so the bias is uh, you would call this a bias, and you would pick a more complex model because you're not able to get to uh, this one percent uh, number. And you know that some other classifier, in this case human, can actually get to that number, right? Um, but let's say you had uh, uh, numbers like this: you had human level performance one percent, training error two percent, but validation error six percent. That means uh, uh, you have what is roughly called variance, and uh, you wanna either try to regularize. Uh, and early stopping is just uh, you know is also again to not overfit. Uh, uh, and you know, want to get more data as well, okay? Uh, so because these two numbers are very far away, okay? And uh, and you can have both. You can have both, right? Uh, uh, you can have human level performance far away from the training error. And training error itself is far away from the validation error. And uh, and then you'll have to do, you know, even pick a more complex model, change the architecture. You may have to. Uh, get more data, um, try regularizing your model, and so on. So, so these numbers are useful to determine wh where you want to go next. Okay. And uh, this computing in these numbers and taking decisions is slightly different from uh, what you would do in uh, uh, the shallow ML uh, type of workflow. Uh, because in shallow ML, let's say you already fixed your family to be uh, random forest based methods or uh, gradient boosted trees, decision trees, or whatever, uh, like SVM, then you're somewhat limited in terms of increasing the complexity of the model. You know? uh, there are, of course, hyperparameters that you can change, um, but you are, you are limited in certain way in terms of the capacity of the model. Uh, and so throwing more data, as you saw in the, almost the first slide, it plateaus. It won't increase your performance. Um, uh, whereas in the deep learning regime, you can actually change the performance. You know, you can get more data. You can build more complex models. So both, both directions you can uh, uh, move forward, and therefore uh, you can improve. So, for example, if the training error is high, you train a bigger model. You know, train a, train longer. You get a new architecture. In fact, you need to be in a position where you really, really, really overfit your data with a really complex complex model, and then you know scale back and see if I can if you had the computational resources. Uh, and then scale back to a model which doesn't overfit too much. Okay, uh, and if your validation error is too high, then uh, uh, you really need to uh, get more data uh, because uh, there's a gap between uh, what's happening here and what's happening here. What you're seeing in the uh, 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 validation. Okay, 
So here the coupling is weaker. So you can get a bigger model, you can get more data and kind of decrease uh, training and uh, validation errors. Okay. Um, and how do you get more data deeply? One, one direction, let's say, uh, is to shift, uh, you know, the shift in deep learning based uh, ML workflows versus uh, shallow workflows is uh, you have to put some effort, but that effort is not on feature engineering, that effort is towards uh, getting more data, right? Uh, so there are some simple tricks and even in the uh, image based uh, uh, lectures, like uh, we saw that we could augment our data. So we could crop the image and still see, keep the same label, right? Uh, so similarly, even in the text, uh, uh, text domain, we could uh, kind of, uh, uh, let's say in one of the auxiliary tasks, we could change, we could randomly swap a, a, a word and create a negative example. So things like that, uh, uh, you should, you should, you should, you know, that, that's like adding examples, right? Adding more examples in your training data. So for example, for, if you wanted OCR data, you get an image, you actually get an image from the internet, put text, uh, because you can generate text, uh, put text on a random part on that image and now you have a OCR input ready. You know the true label, which is the text that you need to extract, you know the actual, you, you've created the input, right? Uh, for speech data as well, you can first produce a very clear speech in a, in a, in a, <coughs> in a a very controlled environment and then you can add all sorts of noises that you can you can get you know in different locations you know in, in a crowded space inside a car inside a classroom all that and same with uh, video game data that you've seen in reinforcement learning where people were uh, i think in the first class i was showing the game breakout so they have video game data they have a real simulator so uh, they're getting data cheaply to build their models right but uh, uh, sometimes you know this is not possible, and you really have to spend money. And in the uh, for deep learning workflows, it's okay to spend uh, uh, money, especially with crowdsourcing-based uh, methods. If you have large text corpus, if you have uh, large image corpus, you can get uh, tags for you know whatever labels or whatever uh, output side that you want you want to have aligned with the input. Uh, you can get it through crowdsourcing. Uh, and uh, it's also good to have a unified data warehouse. Uh, in 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 your organization typically and uh, yeah it's data should not be in silos if it's in, if it's a data based organization okay so let's now uh, very quickly turn to uh, validation and test uh, I already alluded to uh, validation error and test error one key thing you should definitely definitely you know if you are the product manager uh, let's say uh, your validation example should be very very similar to test data okay because your team is gonna actually uh, train or overfit or whatever with the validation data. I mean, you'll, you will help keep the test data with yourself, right? You're not going to show the test data uh, to your team. Uh, but the team is going to work on that uh, objective of doing well on the validation data. So your validation data better be similar to your test data. Otherwise, your team is going to spend three months and do really well on the validation data and you use that model on your test and then you're nowhere, okay? Um, so validation data is a, is a problem spec uh, for, for ML project. Uh, Okay, and uh, even in validation, what teams typically do, and what you could also do, even if you have small data sets, is uh, you break down the error to figure out where the errors are being made in your model, right? Whether even if it's a logistic classifier, or whether it's a you know VGG net style uh, deep network, you have to figure out in which subset of cases you are, you know why is why is it not detecting cats on certain size or cats of certain type compared to let's say cats of other types. You know you need to break down, and that you can do. You know, you have validation validation data. You know the true labels, okay? Uh, but there will be risk of overfitting uh, on this com on this compared to uh, test. Eventually, if you look at the validation data too much and try to reduce the validation error, because that's your objective, right? Reduce validation error. Um, so that's the point with respect to validation and test. Um, and the last part is uh, only specific to uh, deep learning, and that's the notion of human level performance. So Many papers or uh, many uh, public reports, uh, PR uh, releases, they typically kind of say uh, our, our, uh, our AI system can do better than uh, doctors, better than uh, uh, humans, right, in certain tasks. Uh, uh, that's because, you know, progress after human level becomes difficult. So let's say this is the data and you have, uh, you know, performance. Uh, if you know the human level uh, uh, performance, on let's say image uh, image uh, what is that object classification the ImageNet problem, then you know how to 
potentially get there, let's say. With deep models, as I said, you can throw more data, more complex models, you can, you can have a good curve there. But once you cross human level data, um, you don't know. I mean, you don't know the knowledge of the theoretical limit of performance in the sense that uh, there is never going to be, you know, classifiers need not always have 100% accuracy. We'll never typically have 100% accuracy. There's something called uh, base error in the sense uh, uh, the best classifier can only cl reach that accuracy or that error level. You cannot beat that level, okay, because of noise, let's say, because of randomness, uh, which is external to predict, it's not predictable, okay. So, uh, once you don't know this benchmark, you don't know where that, uh, whether that uh, base error is like a, a lo above here or is it right after this, you know, because base error is right there, you can't really do anything. You, there's no predictability anymore to squeeze out, okay. Um, when, when you're worse than humans, then you can do better by, especially in a deep learning context, you can do better by getting more data doing error analysis I was talking about, estimating bias and variance numbers and, you know, figuring out whether you want complicated model or not. Uh, so, for example, like in this case, let's say training error is 5%, evaluation error is 10%, which is typically you'll see in your shallow uh, uh, ML projects, right? Let's say you, you worked on something, you saw 25% uh, accuracy on, uh, not 25%, error 25% and validation error uh, 30%, okay? What should you do there? It's not clear. Right, um, but if you knew that human performance is somewhere, then you can do something. Like if, if you knew that human performance is four percent in year, and and the numbers are like this, then you know that there is a better address this gap first, and then maybe address that gap. Okay. Um, but what if human performance is like this? Okay. Human uh, human performance fifteen percent, and your your machine is doing better than humans. It's not clear where where's the ceiling, okay? And it's, and it's kind of hard to, uh, uh, I mean, you can make progress by taking wild guesses and whatever, but um, it's not clear uh, what to do, okay? And uh, another thing which you'll see in organizations is, uh, you know, top management will come and say, what can deep learning do, <laughs> okay? Uh, so, for example, let's say, you know, Uber, let's say you're a product manager and uh, you have to specify a self-driving car, <laughs> then how do you specify a self-driving car, you know, it's very hard to spec uh, what an AI system or a deep learning system can do and, uh, you know, for example, even, even for things like, let's say, a sentiment classifier, you know, you are, you are owner of, uh, uh, let's say, Netflix and people are leaving uh, uh, information uh, about whatever they see and what should be accuracy? Is it 90%, 80%, is 50% enough? I'm not sure, uh, and uh, I don't know how product managers, managers decide. And uh, and so let's address the more simpler problem. What can uh, deep learning do? Uh, some people will say anything, you know. But I think uh, you need to quantify that. And uh, in this case, uh, Andrew, uh, you know, by, at Baidu, he says uh, um, basically anything that a typical person can do in less than one second, okay, roughly. So especially with the uh, object uh, classification, uh, roughly you can, you know, once you get an image of a cat, you can immediately say it's a cat or, or something like that. Um, um, or look at a picture of a person and, uh, and tell the expression of the person. Is, are they frowning? Are they crying? Or something like that. Um, or if you have sequences like time series or, uh, or, or a sequence of uh, video frames or a uh, sequence of text and then predicting the outcome of sequence or sequence of events, uh, that deep learning can kind of do okay, so those are typically the buckets where, when people ask what can deep learning do for my organization, uh, typically these are the f probably the rules of thumb that you should use. Okay, um, so that's it for this part. Any questions? These are all mostly tips uh, compiled by uh, people who have been in the industry for a long time. So, yeah. The training error here is measured in relation to the two labels, right? Yeah, yeah. Training and validation, your team already has, right? You, you are the manager. I kept a, kept aside the test. I gave the guys a huge training set. They'll keep aside, let's say, a validation set, um, and they'll train. The question is, if the training error is 
the human error is 15 percent, then how can you say you are training error yourself? Because the no, you can do better than you can do better than humans, right? I mean, there is no, no the training the data here yeah for the training set was labeled by you. Yes, I mean that's that's uh, that's true. It need not always be labeled by you, humans, right? The algorithmic ways to label things as well, right? A very meticulous, you know, rule-based, uh, you know, very uh, thing. So, you know, it need not be a neural network or a classifier which labels things. You could have you could have an algorithmic ways of labeling things, right? Sometimes these need not be even with labels, right? These can be just measurements. Like uh, let's say it's a production plant, you're measuring uh, something like. Uh, uh, pressure compared to let's say pressure points at different locations of uh, huge equipment. You know that's not human generated. Um, labels need not be always human generated. Okay, so actually that's all I had. So a uh, couple of one quick thing. Basically, uh, we covered uh, only core blocks. I basically just got familiarized with them mostly. Uh, with skipped over a lot of uh, uh, modeling equations and so on. We looked at CNNs, RNNs and embeddings. Uh, so lots of things that we have not touched is in, especially in optimization we have not touched anything. In Keras for example you had to give uh, the argument for uh, which optimization technique you would use. Uh, there were a few other options that you could have tried. Uh, uh, so there are, there are techniques, there are variants in, uh, on gradient descent uh, family of uh, optimizing optimization techniques. The unsupervised methods which actually uh, are very useful especially when you don't have labeled data but you have lots of uh, unlabeled data, right? So let's say a lot of unlabeled images but uh, very few labeled images in your domain. Let's say it's medical classification, medical uh, image classification problem. Then uh, you can actually do unsupervised way you can learn some features and get the feature representation. Just like you use a pre-trained VGG network to get a feature representation for the 4096 dimensional vector. Uh, not VGG, but uh, in AlexNet it's 4096 dimensional vector. Uh, you can use unsupervised methods to kind of use the unlabeled data because if labeling is costly, then you want to extract some information from your unlabeled data, right? Uh, and there are many variations of uh, the few models that we've seen here uh, in speech, text, and vision that we have not covered. Later in graphical models, we may touch something called uh, restricted Boltzmann machines because those are certain types of graphical models. And in reinforcement learning, we may touch uh, that uh, that game, game playing agent that we saw in the first uh, lecture called uh, DQ learning network, DQN. Okay. Um, so in summary, today uh, we looked at word to vec embedding uh, in a bit more detail. Uh, we looked at some implementation details of uh, sequence to sequence family of uh, problems. Uh, these significantly extend beyond classification, and uh, uh, that's I guess the gap from let's say a traditional ML uh, technique. Uh, we looked at the practical considerations of ML workflows in uh, workplaces and uh, uh, it's good to have this perspective in mind. Okay, That's it.